We're now coming to uh, our final and in many ways uh, extremely important uh, part of today's session. Uh, and I'm giving the floor over to Professor Peter Tyson, who will uh, introduce the Steinbrocken uh, lecture. It's a great honor that I can introduce Cass Mudde. We will give the Stan Rocken uh, lecture of this year. Mudde's name is already closely linked to the one of illustrious comparative political scientist Stein Rocken, because in 2008 he was awarded with the prestigious Stan Rocken Prize for comparative social science research notably for his book, Populist Radical Right Parties in Europe, published by Cambridge University Press in 2007. When I was thinking uh, about the best way to introduce Cass as a political scientist, one thing immediately came to my mind. Cass knows his research object by heart. By knowing by heart, I don't mean the semi-automated memorizing of things just the opposite. In his comparative study of radical rightist parties, Cass really goes to the heart of the matter and does not settle for shallow descriptions. Moreover, he wants to study the radical right in a dispassionate, but nevertheless respectful and non not condescending way. For him, the radical right represents a radical version of man mainstream political ideas and not a mere pathology. Cass is not a scholar that sticks solely to books, party manifestos or surveys. Participatory observation is not an abstract concept for him, as he deems it important to visit party meetings and to speak to local activists in order to really understand parties and the broader party system in which they work. Cass knows his research object by heart. Cass is also a real comparativist in whatever he does. In this respect, he's certainly no coincidence that his mentor and supervisor of his PhD was the late professor Peter Mayer. Down to earth and open to differences. Some would say these are the typical characteristics of a Dutchman. But Cass is not easy to stereotype, certainly not in a national way. Cass is the only Dutchman I know who is supporter of the German Mannschaft. Cass is a real comparativist. As a ground hopper, Groundhopper, Cass Mudder, for example, visits and compares the atmospheres of different football grounds all over the world. He collects, so to say, football stadia. And also in this enterprise, he is meticulous and collects all his assessments on a Groundhopper blog. Cass also travels a lot. In his relatively short career, he already worked in many departments all over the world. Leiden, Budapest, Edinburgh, Indiana, Oregon, just to name a few. But for several years, Cass Mudde also worked at the University of Antwerp. And we were very fortunate to have him. Cass was a very popular PhD supervisor. And this was not only related to his know-how, but also to his friendly attitude. During the period 2004-2005, he was chair of our department, the Department of Political Science. Cass brought ambition and a thorough international orientation to our department. From a small department with two political scientists, we have grown to a department with 12 full-time staff members and about 30 PhD students. A nice token of this expansion is the organization of these ECPR joint sessions with the help of the City of Antwerp, the National Research, Research Councils and the National Associations of Political Science. Thank you all, especially the local organizing committee. Now we come to the moment where you all have, be, have been waiting for, 
to see the man himself. But unfortunately, a live performance is not possible. Because of acute health problems, also Kasmede was not able to come and to fly over from the States where he is currently working. Luckily, it did not take us a long time to find a worthy stand-in in the person of Chris de Schauer. Chris is research professor in comparative political science at the Free University of Brussels and president of the Dutch-speaking Belgian Political Science Association. In short, he is l'imminence grise of Belgian political science and a perfect incarnation of Casmude. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with a happy heart and a tear in either eye, I present you Casmude, this time personified by Chris de Schouw. I must confess that this is very, very awkward. This is the first time in my life that I will read a speech written by somebody else. Um, it will also be the last time that I will do that. I have added this to the long list of reasons why I will never become a politician. Um, Unlike politicians who read out speeches written by ghost writers, I will not one second pretend that these ideas are mine. This is Kasmude. And unlike some politicians reading out texts written by ghost writers, I will have a clue. I will know what I'm talking about. 45 years ago, Lipset and Rockham published their famous freezing hypothesis of West European party systems. While the thesis has been contested after roughly every electoral victory of a new party or major defeat of an old party, Peter Mayer concluded still in the mid-1990s the freezing hypothesis remains largely valid at least up till now. But a lot has changed since Peter Rose wrote these words. Of particular importance to this lecture, populist radical right parties have not only further increased their electoral support and parliamentary presence across Western Europe, they have also finally entered national governments. Since the humble beginnings of the so-called third waves, third wave, sorry, of the radical right now three decades ago, commentators have been warning of its dangers to European democracy. Asked by the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung about the greatest risk for Europe, EU President Hermann van Rompuy said, referring explicitly to the populist radical right Vlaams Belang party in his native country, Belgium, the big danger is populism. He said this in 2010, at the height of the biggest economic crisis in the post-war era. The sentiment of a growing danger and influence of the populist radical right is not limited to political commentators, however. The media is full of articles about Europe's populist radical right being on the rise, or more dramatically, on the march, leading to Europe's drift to the right and Europe's far-right problem. The perceived importance of the populist radical right can also be seen in the disproportionate academic attention devoted to it. While one was hard-pressed to find many non-German studies on the populist radical right before 1990, today more than 100 scholars from across the globe work on the topic and produce many more articles and books on this particular party family than on all other party families combined. Most academics suggest or claim outright that the populist radical right is an important factor in contemporary European politics. They point to a broad range of developments that have caused it and are allegedly caused by it, from increased dissatisfaction with politics and racist violence at the mass level to the dominance of right-wing discourse and politics at the elite level. In most cases, the evidence is illustrative at best, and correlation is taken for causation. To be fair, many effects are theoretically very difficult to prove, given that they relate to indirect effects 
or are dependent, dependent upon non-existent data. In recent years, it has become popular to speak of a verrechtsing or right turn in European politics. The thesis, or this, this thesis holds, that the populist radical right has pushed European politics to the right by directly or indirectly influencing the positions and salience of the issues on the political agenda. For example, Martin Schulz, then leader of the socialist faction in the European Parliament, wrote that what worries him most about the recent rise of the populist radical right is not so much the extreme right violence, but the persistent permanent breach of taboos that makes extreme right-wing ideology respectable by clothing it in the garb of democratic legitimacy. In this lecture, I, Kasmude, will provide an analysis of the effects of the, political, of the populist radical right on the people, on the parties, on the policies, and on the polities of Western Europe. But first, it is worth looking briefly at what and who they are, and then at their actual presence in elections, parliaments, and governments. Populist radical right parties share a core ideology that includes at least nativism, authoritarianism, and populism. With nativism, I refer to a combination of nationalism and xenophobia, in which a monocultural nation state is the ideal, and all non-natives are perceived as threatening. Authoritarianism entails a strict belief in order and its strict enforcement within society through discipline and law and order policies. Finally, populism sees society as being essentially divided between two antagonistic and homogenous groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite, and want politics to reflect the general will of the people. It is the combination of all three factors, all three features, that defines the populist radical right party family. While virtually everyone agrees on the inclusion of some parties in this family, most notably the prototypical Front National in France, there is considerable debate on various others. In some cases, this debate involves the question, from what point on a party is or is no longer considered to be populist radical right. This table provides an overview of both the highest and most recent results of the main populist radical right parties in national parliamentary elections in Western Europe. What stand out here are some striking high and recent results. Most notably, today the SVP is far and away the biggest party in Switzerland while the populist radical right constitutes the second largest party family in Austria, that is BZÖ and FPÖ together. And finally, the Danish People Party and the Dutch Party for Freedom are both the third biggest party in their respective country. At the same time, the alleged populist radical right wave is not lapping at the shores of all West European countries equally. In fact, most, in fact, populist radical right parties are represented in the national par parliaments of just half of the 17 West European countries. Particularly, particularly insightful is a comparison with the Green Party family, often considered its mirror image and the only other relatively new kid on the block to have emerged since the freezing of the West European party systems. As this table shows, the average score in national parliamentary elections of populist radical right parties is not much higher than that of the Greens. And more surprising, perhaps, is that while the populist radical right is slightly more successful in elections, it is slightly less successful in entering government, although this is changing. Since 1980, the Greens have been part of 10 governments, while the populist radical right partook only in eight. However, while the 1990s were the highlight of green government, governmental participation, the 21st century seems more favorable towards the populist radical right. In addition, the populist radical right has been the official support party of several minority governments too. This all notwithstanding, 
populist radical right government participation remains a rarity in Western Europe. Indeed, of the more than 200 national governments that have been formed in Western Europe since 1980, a mere eight included a populist radical right party. In all cases, it was a junior partner. Against the fact that only three Western European countries have had a majority government with official populist radical right participation, Austria, Italy and Switzerland, while two had minority governments with their support, Denmark and the Netherlands, the trend is clearly up. In the 1980s, there was no such government. In the 1990s, only one, Berlusconi won. Yet in the first decade of the 21st century, there have been seven majority governments and three minority governments. Still today, only one majority government includes a populist radical right party, the Swiss, while in just one other country, such a party officially supports the minority government, the Netherlands. This all is not to mean that populist radical right parties are irrelevant in West European politics. The sheer fact that, at least in electoral terms, it is the most successful new party family to emerge in Europe since the end of the Second World War warns against such a simplistic conclusion. At the same time, it should create some initial skepticism about the often alarmist claims of populist radical right influence in contemporary Western European politics. Commentators and scholars mostly assert the influence of the populist radical right. There is relatively little scholarly work that actually investigates this assertion empirically and systematically. Moreover, many studies focus on only one small aspect of the asserted effect, most notably on immigration policies and work with a limited and often implicit theoretical framework in which governmental parties are assumed to be, if not the only, then at least the all-powerful actors in policy making. And finally, all scholars are faced with, an important, with important case and data problems. There are few cases of large populist radical right parties, let alone governments with populist right with populist radical right participation. And we lack reliable, comparative, cross-national and cross-temporal data on many crucial aspects, most notably public attitudes. Hence, most studies either feature only a limited number of countries and policy fields or use problematic data. This lecture, unfortunately, faces many of the same problems and can therefore only be considered as a first stab at a comprehensive assessment. I, Kasmude, will assess the impact of the populist radical right on four aspects of West European politics. People, parties, policies and polities. The analysis is presented in that democratic order, assuming that the mostly oppositional populist radical right first influenced the people, leading to a response of the mainstream parties worried about electoral competition, which introduced new policies, either in coalition with the populist radical right or not, and thereby possibly changing the whole political system. According to the According to the Verrechtsing thesis, the rise of populist radical right parties has affected European people by changing their issue positions and priorities. Charles Westin, for instance, claims that, I quote, when protest parties such as Vlaams Belang and Front National receive a considerable share of the vote, the gravitational center of public opinion is shifted significantly to the right. In short, the parties, through their agenda-setting power, have increased the salience of populist radical right issues, like immigration, crime, corruption, European integration for the population, and have changed the people's position on these issues. It is clear that populist radical right parties profit from the increased salience of social cultural issues, but the so-called silent revolution largely predates the rise of the populist radical right. With regard to the, most, to the more specific issues of the populist radical right, there has been a clear increase of the salience of most of these issues, most notably immigration, in the past 30 years. However, the increase of saliency is very volatile 
and seems hardly related to either the electoral strength or the government participation of populist radical right parties. In some cases, the changes in salience of the immigration issue seems to follow the so-called thermostatic model. That is, growing public salience about the immigration issue leads to electoral success of the populist radical right and an increase in policy activity on the immigration issue. This could be seen in Denmark, for example, where the salience of immigration rose sharply between 1990 and 2001 when the populist radical right, the FP, achieved its, its electoral breakthrough, yet fell again in 2005, after the first period of the FP's support for the minority government and a tightening of immigration laws. In general, there is considerable debate about the effect of populist radical right parties on people's attitudes and issue positions, and scholarly studies only add to that confusion. Several studies claim a significant effect of populist radical right parties on attitudes toward immigration and integration at the mass level. But others find a more limited effect, for example, only by cultural racist parties or by entrepreneurial radical right-wing parties, or no significant effect at all. While part of the confusion is undoubtedly based on the different aspects of the immigration issue that the studies focus on, as well as on the different data and time periods, at the very least it does not seem to indicate that electorally successful populist radical right parties cause fundamental changes in public attitudes on immigration and integration. Another issue that has received a lot of attention is public support for European integration. As populist radical right parties are often the most powerful Eurosceptic actor in their country, various commentators have linked the rise in public Euroscepticism to the success of these parties. While I am unaware of research that empirically proves the correlation, let alone the causation, there is ample empirical um, research on Euroscepticism that points in a different direction. If one looks at public support for European integration across countries and times, as measured by the Eurobarometer, support fluctuates erratically and seemingly unrelated to any electoral results. Moreover, at least since the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, there is a clear convergence in the decline in support for European integration across Europe. Cross-national data on attitudes related to crime are hard to find and often only have limited data points. Whether one focuses on electoral success or government participation of populist radical right parties, data on public attitudes on crime are overall inconclusive, generally showing either quite stable positions or fairly erratic and unrelated changes. Finally, one of the key points in the propaganda of populist radical right parties is that corrupt elites have hijacked the political system and silenced the voice of the people by conducting backroom deals and enforcing a conspiracy of silence. At first sight, it seems that they have been able to convince a growing part of the population. Western Europe has become a continent of disaffected democracies with decreasing trust in political institutions and public satisfaction with national democracy. But much of the growth of popular dissatisfaction predates the rise of the populist radical right and probably caused its rise rather than was caused by it. Moreover, a quick look at Eurobarometer data shows that public satisfaction with national democracy is volatile and unrelated to electoral success or government participation of populist radical right parties. In fact, as Jens Rudgren recently pointed out, popular dissatisfaction grew in Sweden at the time it had no successful populist radical right party, yet popular satisfaction grew in Denmark when its populist radical right was supporting the minority government. In conclusion, while populist radical right parties might have affected the position and salience of certain issues for some parts of the population, they seem to have rarely changed their more long-term attitudes. And I has, as I have argued elsewhere, they also didn't really need to 
as the public attitudes of many Europeans were already in line with the basic tenets of the populist radical right ideology, even if in a more moderate form, before they rose in the polls. Part of the Verrechtsing thesis is focused on the party level. That is, populist radical right parties have moved the established parties to the right. The argument is twofold. One, mainstream parties have become more nativist, authoritarian and populist. And two, this is because of electoral competition from the populist radical right. Some scholars have gone even one step further and argue that populist radical right parties have not only influenced individual mainstream parties, but have also affected party systems. That is the way in which the relevant political parties interact with each other. Most authors argue that populist radical right parties have only influenced mainstream right-wing parties. A good example is Jean-Yves Camus, who argues that the Front National's ideas have had an influence on the political agenda of the right on issues such as immigration, law and order, multiculturalism, and the definition of national identity. Some politicized accounts go much further, claiming that the populist radical right influence can be seen across the political spectrum, at least from mainstream right to mainstream left. At first glance, it seems the latter argument is, more, is most accurate, at least with regard to immigration policies. A recent comparative analysis of election manifestos showed that between 1975 and 2005, both the mainstream right and left increased the salience of the immigration issue and became stricter on the issue. The effect was most pronounced in the period 1995-2005. However, while increased salience of the immigration issue is related to the presence of a relevant populist radical right party, the change to a stricter immigration policy is not. Or, more precisely, it is not for mainstream right-wing parties. In other words, in countries without a successful populist radical right party, the mainstream left will stay away from the issue but the mainstream right will adopt a stricter immigration policy anyway, seeing it as a promising electoral issue. Interestingly, mainstream right-wing parties seem unaffected by coalition participation with the populist radical right, meaning that their anti-immigration position precedes these coalitions and actually enables them. It is important to remember that what is still generally referred to as the immigration issue is actually a multifaceted issue, including both immigration, including political asylum, and integration. Most research conflates the two, assuming that parties hold similar open or restrictive views on both issues. But this is not true. Looking at the platforms of the European party factions, Fraser Duncan and Stephen van Hecke conclude the following. While Christian Democrat and Conservative parties do not differ significantly from their socialist equivalent on control issues, liberal parties are less restrictionist. On integration, both Christian Democrats and Conservatives and liberals have less are less multicultural than socialists and green parties. In other words, in those cases, that the populist radical right has been able to influence other parties on the broader immigration issue, it has been across the political spectrum on immigration control, mostly political asylum, yet only on the right side of the spectrum on the issue of integration. Less research is available on other issues. The increased talk of law and order policies by first mainstream right wing and also later mainstream left-wing parties is often credited to competition with the populist radical right. However, while this might be the case in countries like Belgium or France, it does not sound very plausible in the cases of Britain or Germany. As authoritarianism is a broadly shared ideological feature, it probably was more the product of the conservative surge that started in the 1980s than of the rise of populist radical right in the 90s.
More recently, the various terrorist attacks of the 21st century and the consequent war on terror have been the most important factor in the securitization of most aspects of politics. And finally, in line with my own argument on the emergence of a populist zeitgeist in the 1990s, Gian Pietro Mazzoleni speaks of the populist contamination of mainstream political discourse. The argument here is not that all political parties in Western Europe have become essentially populist parties. In fact, recent research shows that the manifestos of European parties have not become more populist. But most parties do use populist, populist themes in their political discourse, something Mazzolini refers to as soft populism. Moreover, the adoption of soft populism is not limited to mainstream parties in party systems with strong populist radical right parties. First of all, there are some important other populist parties in Europe that operate in this respect as functional equivalents. Most notably, neoliberal populist parties like the Forza Italia and the Norwegian Progress Party. But even in countries without any significant populist party, mainstream parties have adopted populist rhetoric. rhetoric. An oft-mentioned example is New Labour in Britain, particularly under Tony Blair. While most authors have focused on the effects on the discourse and policy positions of individual mainstream parties, some have argued that the effect is also systemic. That is, the whole party system is affected. The rise of populist radical right parties has changed the way in which relevant parties interact with each other. Some authors argue that populist radical right parties have affected some European party systems by opening up new possibilities for government coalitions. Tim Bale, for example, argues that just like the Greens did for the left in the 1990s, populist radical right parties have enabled the possibility of right-wing governments rather than centre-right governments, in part also because of a turn to the right by centre-right parties. With some qualifications, this holds true for Austria, Denmark, Italy, and the Netherlands. Yet not so much for Switzerland. His argument, Tim Bale's argument, that the emergence of a populist radical right parties, as well as the responses of the mainstream right to this rise, has created bipolarizing party systems, has more limited applicability. It so far seems to hold true only for Denmark, where the right-wing minority governments were succeeded by a left-wing majority government in 2011. And while the Italian party system has also transformed into bipolar bloc opposition, this was the consequence of the implosion of the old party system in the early 1990s, in which the populist radical right played little role. In Austria, the right-wing governments of Prime Minister Schüssel have been replaced by the traditional grand coalitions, while recent history seems to indicate that this is also, highly, that this is also a highly likely scenario for the Dutch case. Finally, Swiss government coalitions are determined by the magic formula, which is barely related to outcome of parliamentary elections. In addition, even in the few cases that the available options for coalitions have changed, the logic of coalition formation has not. While many academics and mainstream politicians have argued that populist radical right parties are special parties, which require particular additional arguments to be considered coalitionsfähig, comparative research by Sarah de Lange has shown that existing coalition theories perfectly explain coalitions with and without radical populist right parties. She argues that mainstream right-wing parties prefer populist radical right to mainstream left-wing parties because they are cheap coalition partners, which can easily be dominated and with which coalition agreements can be concluded without too many difficulties. This would mean that if the mainstream left gets cheaper, or the populist radical right more expensive, or alternative convergence between mainstream left and right will be larger than between mainstream right and populist radical right, the mainstream right will return to its old coalition patterns, as can be seen in Austria and, to a certain extent, the Netherlands. As with all political parties in power, 
we would expect populist radical right parties to primarily push policies related to their ideological core. Based upon an analysis of their ideological agenda, this would mean issues like immigration and integration, as well as European integration with regard to nativism, law and, law and order policies in line with their authoritarianism, and a focus on corruption and direct democracy to reflect their populism. While some authors have demonstrated that governments with populist radical right parties have successfully pushed through preferred policies on issues like immigration, integration and law and order, albeit with much more variation than is generally acknowledged, others have shown similar developments in countries without populist radical right parties in government and sometimes even in parliament. Even if it is true that countries with large populist radical right parties have introduced more radical right legislation, as some authors contend, these policy effects are at best indirect. That is a reflection of shifts in the policy preferences of mainstream parties because of perceived electoral pressure from populist radical right parties, rather than the result of successful legislative initiatives from oppositional populist radical right parties. Logically, governmental parties dominate Western, Europe, Western Europe's parliamentary systems and legislative initiatives by opposition parties are much less often successful. This holds even truer for populist radical right parties, which seem to be either embraced in government or shunned in parliament. Whenever represented in parliament, they have proposed legislation on a variety of issues, though mostly immigration, integration and law and order. In most cases, however, these proposals went nowhere, as they were either too radical to be supported by a parliamentary majority, or other parties had an agreement not to support legislative initiatives by populist radical right parties. So returning to the few governments with populist radical right participation, what was the role of these parties in shaping governmental policies? As we have seen, they did push some policies in line with populist radical right preferences. But so did governments without a populist radical right party. And we therefore have to ask ourselves whether the populist radical right parties were really that relevant in getting these policies implemented. Most research on populist radical right parties in government focuses, in, focuses exclusively on immigration and integration policies. Following Minkenberg's early conclusion that when the radical right holds executive office, a right turn occurs primarily in cultural policies. Andres Zaslove, for instance, argues that the Freedom Party and the Lega Nord have been instrumental in passing more restrictive immigration policy, limiting the flow of immigrants and the ability of non-EU labour to live, work and settle permanently in either Austria or Italy. Yet populist radical right support parties of minority governments seem to also have had their main successes in influencing immigration legislation. But many authors have cautioned against two strong conclusions, arguing that against these successes of the issue of immigration stand many failures too. With regard to Austria, Italy and Switzerland, scholars have noted only limited influence of the populist radical right within their respective governments. Reflecting on the policies of the Berlusconi governments in Italy, which so far have provided the most favorable conditions to any populist radical right party in Western Europe, Marco Tarchi concludes that some of the issues which were held dear by the populist electorate were tackled but in much more moderate terms than suggested by the party's manifestos, especially that of the Lega Nord. In short, the government record of the populist radical right does not look very impressive, not even on their key issue of immigration. In fact, particularly after the spectacular implosions of first the Dutch Lispim Fortuyn, and then the Austrian FPÖ, it became popular to call for the inclusion of populist radical right parties in government because they were assumed to be destined to fail and implode. This has since subsided, 
undoubtedly in part because of the Berlusconi governments in Italy and the Rasmussen governments in Denmark, which were not only remarkably stable, but also, hard, but also hardly hurt the populist governmental parties electorally. After the previous assessments, it should come as no surprise that populist radical right parties have not affected the type of polity in Western Europe. None of the European countries has become autocratic, not even those that have had populist radical parties in government. This might seem self-evident today, but much of the academic and public interest in this party family has been sparked by the assumption that the populist radical right is a threat to the existing political system because of its alleged anti-democratic character. It is actually not that surprising that populist radical right parties have not changed the democratic nature of the system, as they support both popular sovereignty and majority rule. Their relationship with liberal democracy is less supportive. However, they are essentially monist, highly skeptical, skeptical sorry, about minority rights and the politics of compromise. And in fact, in several cases, they have tried to undermine the independence of counterbalancing balancing political institutions, most notably the courts and the media, as well as limit minority rights. However, the legal challenges were largely unsuccessful and the main onslaught was rhetorical. Undoubtedly, the most comprehensive challenge to liberal democracy in Western Europe has come from the various Berlusconi governments in Italy, albeit mostly at the initiative of Forza Italia rather than the Lega Nord. However, when the government finally proposed controversial reforms of the political system, which would give the Prime Minister in particular much greater powers, it failed, or hardly changed the institutions and practices of the system as such. In short, while populist radical right parties have never challenged the bare essence of Western Europe's democratic systems, this cannot be said of the fundamentals of liberal democracy. The fact that no country was turned into an illiberal democracy not even when populist radical right parties were in government, is to be credited to the resilience of coalition parties, civil society, and the courts. It is here that European democracies of the late 20th century differ most strongly from those of the early 20th century. Winkenberg's apt summary of the essential impact of populist radical right parties on European democracies, based on a very limited set of cases and made over 10 years ago, still holds good. The government of the people, by the people and for the people is not at stake. But the concept of the people is. As far as there has been influence of populist radical right parties on European democracies, it has been on redefining the people, or more accurately, re redefining the people in the manner that they had always been implicitly defined in the pre-multicultural society, namely as ethnically homogenous. This influence has been mostly indirect and in line with the democratic process, in the sense that the populist radical right politicized mostly existing anti-immigrant sentiments in the population, which encouraged mainstream parties, if encouragement was needed, which encouraged mainstream parties to adopt their issues and issue position, albeit in a more moderate form and change policies accordingly. However, although some populist radical right parties may be seen as catalysts of this process, they are neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition. Their success was enabled by pre-existence of a fertile breeding ground of popular resentment around issues of immigration, crime and party politics across Western Europe. This explains why countries without successful populist radical right parties went through a roughly similar process. For example, 
surveys shows a substantial rise in anti-immigrant sentiment in all European countries between 1988 and 2000, but the rise was steepest in the early period, 1988-1994, which is just before the most pronounced shift towards a more anti-immigration position occurred among mainstream political parties across the continent. In other words, mainstream right-wing parties are more responsible for the recent anti-immigration turn than populist radical right parties. While all have moved to a more strict immigration and integration position, some have chosen to use this particular issue to gain governmental power by co-opting either the populist radical right parties, like in Austria, Denmark or the Netherlands, or their voters, such as in France. In most of these cases, the mainstream right adopted not just a more radical immigration position, but also implemented more strict immigration policies than in other countries. Finally, while electoral pressure from the populist radical right does have an effect on the position on, on, the, position on the immigration issue of mainstream left-wing parties, this is at least strongly mediated by the responses of mainstream right-wing parties. In short, the mere presence of a strong populist radical right neither automatically leads to a more anti-immigrant position in a country, nor does its absence guarantee liberal cosmopolitanism. Politics matters, in particular the politics of the mainstream right-wing parties. It is also unlikely that the populist radical right played an important role in the recent move towards a more critical support of European integration. Much of the critique is related to new developments within the EU, starting with the Maastricht Treaty, which are partly challenging the preferred visions of European integration of mainstream parties and their supporters. In other words, as the EU has become more defined, more people and parties see particular things particular things wrong with it. And further, most of the more outspoken Eurosceptic parties today developed their position independent of, and often well before, the relevance of the populist radical right. And finally, strong opposition to aspects of European integration comes at least as much from other political actors, most notably radical left parties and trade unions, as was the case in the Dutch and French referendums on the European constitution. Populist radical right parties have been even less relevant for the authoritarian turn. Like with immigration, there has always been a significant gap between the progressive elites and the more conservative masses on law and order issues. The policy turn started in most countries in the 1980s as a consequence of neoconservative influence within the mainstream right and sometimes left, well before the populist right started to gain significant electoral support. And while the populist radical right has been a strong supporter of strict anti-terrorist legislation, the post-9-11 securitization of politics was broadly supported within the political mainstream and needed neither the, neither the initiative nor the support of populist radical rights. Related to their anti-establishment discourse, many populist radical right parties push for the introduction of plebiscitarian measures to democratize the political systems and break the power of the so-called corrupt political establishment. They do not seem to have been very successful or forceful on this issue, however. While the number of national referendums in Western Europe has certainly increased, most were related to European integration and were either constitutionally required or the consequence of pressure from other political parties. In short, while the Verrechtsing thesis seems correct in terms of a move to more right-wing positions on socio-cultural issues at the mass and elite level, it is wrong on the main cause of this process. Rather than the populist radical right, it has been the mainstream right wing that has pushed West European politics to the right, in part in response to media and popular responses to relatively recent developments, such as multi-ethnic societies, the Maastricht Treaty and 
And in many cases, the mainstream left, the mainstream left has proven either incompetent to halt the turn, such, such as on integration, or has been remarkably collaborative in supporting it, such as on immigration control and securization. One of the main reasons of the limited impact of the populist radical right is that they are mostly, in Paul Lucardi's terms, purifiers rather than prophets. Populist radical right parties push for policy changes on existing issues, not for new issues like the Greens did with environment. And as argued before, on many issues, the mainstream parties had already done much of the groundwork before the populist radical right was strong enough to challenge them. A good example is the alleged new issue of immigration control. The space for maneuver in this particular field was already significantly restricted before the third wave of the radical right even started. Most West European countries had by, large, had by and large banned economic integration, economic immigration, sorry, already in 1973-74 as a response to the oil crisis, a good decade before immigration control became a politicized issue. These policies had largely been considered technical measures and were silently approved by political actors across the political spectrum. The most obvious reason, however, is the relatively modest electoral support that these parties generate in parliamentary elections. With an average support of less than 10% of the electorate, few populist radical right parties are major players in their national political system. Moreover, few parties make it into government, majority or minority, and most are shunned by the other parties in parliament. Hence, direct policy influence is already quite rare. And even when populist radical right parties make it to power, they are dogs that bark loudly, but hardly ever bite. There are at least five reasons for the governmental impotence of populist radical right parties. First, populist radical right parties focus on only a few issues, significantly reducing their scope of impact, even if successful. Most importantly, social economic issues are secondary to them and are often log rolled for social cultural issues in negotiations with their coalition partners. Second, political parties are just one of many actors in creating policies. Bureaucracies and non governmental actors severely limit the room to maneuver for parties. This is even more the case for new governmental parties, in particular of the populist radical right, which have few supporters in the major policy networks. Third, populist radical right parties are always junior parties in coalition, with much less experience than both their coalition partners and the other actors within the policy networks. Hence, they often have only nominal control over policy fields, even in cases that they are officially controlling the ministry. Fourth, coalition governments are the outcomes of processes of policy convergence between mainstream and radical right-wing parties that predate the, gov the governmental cooperation. Consequently, many governmental policies or even populist radical right issues like immigration reflect at least as much the program of the mainstream right-wing party as that of the populist radical right one. Fifth and final, populist radical right parties prefer to keep one foot in and one foot out of government. They prefer to keep their oppositional image by using radical rhetoric and pushing for two radical policies rather than run the risk of being perceived as a normal governmental party and part of the corrupt elite. This is all not to say that the populist radical right will for always remain a relatively minor nuisance in Western European democracies. Although it is important to remember that in the past three decades, the main threats to liberal democracy have come from the political mainstream rather than the political extremes. That is Silvio Berlusconi in Italy, the Kaczynski brothers in Poland, and currently Viktor Orban in Hungary, as well as from the disturbing anti-terror legislation after 9-11. This notwithstanding, it is important to remain also vigilant towards the populist radical right, 
there are at least three reasons why they could become more influential in the near future. First, partly because of their rise, but mostly because of the transformation of the mass media, we have seen a tabloidization of political discourse in the past decades. Tabloids and populist radical right parties share many similar attitudes and issues, notably on immigration, crime and corruption. And in the past decades, these issues and sentiments have come to dominate the political discourse in Europe. While this does not necessarily tra translate into changing public attitudes and policy changes, it provides at the very least a very favorable discursive opportunity structure for populist radical right parties and policies. Second, although there are important national differences, the electoral trend of the populist radical right is clearly up. Not only are there more successful parties today than 30 years ago, several of them have established themselves in their national political systems. And while the economic crisis has slowed down their, economic, their, their electoral growth by returning the political debate to economic rather than cultural issues, there are good reasons to believe that the post-crisis era could see a resurgence. Most notably, the EU's response to the economic crisis has elevated anxieties about the interconnectedness of the continent, as well as further exposed the fundamental differences between most elites and most people on the desirability of further European and global integration. In many countries, populist radical right parties have already responded by calling for varying degrees of dis disintegration, which might become more popular when people feel again more secure about the economy. Third, and final, some of the successful populist radical right parties have grown up now. They have learned from the mistakes during their first brushes with power and have often gained more experience at the subnational level. Many observers have generalized on the basis of just two cases, the Austrian FPÖ and the Dutch LPF, which both imploded when in government, when in office. However, this is by no means the general rule. The Dutch case was highly unique, a three-month-old party built around a leader killed just before the elections, while the FPÖ is far from dead. In fact, it is probably more radical and more unified than ever. And as for the Italian Lega Nord, it survived three governments largely unscratched, while the Danish DFP and so far the Dutch PVV also seemed unaffected or seem unaffected by their support for minority government. I disagree then with the dominant strain in the populism literature that argues that populist parties are destined for success in opposition and failure in government. Like social democratic parties before the Second World War and green parties in the 1990s, populist radical right parties can make the transformation from successful opposition party to effective governing party. Moreover, with mainstream parties increasingly converging with the populist radical right on cultural policies and the latter continuing to compromise on economic issues, populist radical right parties may well remain the more attractive, that is the cheaper coalition partner for the mainstream right. But even in the unlikely event that populist radical right parties will become major players in West European politics, it is unlikely that this will lead to a fundamental transformation of the political system. As populist radical right parties are not a normal pathology of European democracy, unrelated to its basic values, but rather a pathological normalcy which only strives for the radicalization of mainstream values. In the name of Kasmude, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, of course, Kas uh, worked very hard uh, at putting together this lecture. I know he's worked for a number of weeks and his last few days, although he was in very much pain, were dedicated to making it presentable by uh, 
someone else. And uh, of course, here we had uh, a very clear indication that he was very successful at that. And it, it is a real pity they couldn't be here, of course, to present this piece of work uh, himself. Uh, Again, I, w I wish to thank Chris for the wonderful job he did. I think uh, it was really clear that you did have a clue as to what you were talking about. <laughs> and perhaps we will take advantage of that in the next few minutes. Uh, uh, but obviously, uh, it is a cast that deserves all of our gratitude and appreciation for this very worthy tribute he gave to Stein Rockin. You know, Stein Rockin is uh, uh, Certainly, one of the is one of the founding was one of the founding fathers of the ECPR, and his memory is one that we treasure very much. And therefore, we consider the Steinrocken uh, lecture as within the very important joint sessions, probably the most important moment. Uh, we also m must uh, congratulate uh, Kas Mude for. Uh, an outstanding contribution uh, to the to our understanding of a very important phenomenon, which, of course, uh, could be somewhat disturbing to some of us, but is nevertheless one we need to know much more about. And I think today we have made a great progress in that direction. So, big hand for Kaz and Chris again. Okay, uh, you know, we have had different uh, conclusions of the uh, Steinrocken lecture. Sometimes we've had a debate, sometimes we have not. Uh, not having us here, of course, uh, makes it difficult to have a proper debate, but if, I think we have time, however, so if anybody wants to uh, make a comment, uh, uh, for myself I can say that I'm not surprised that the uh, populist parties uh, were not able to reduce significantly uh, uh, corruption and democracy. The Lega Nord in Italy seemed to have given its contribution to increasing it very much in, in the last few days, uh, but anyway, any uh, uh, comment or any any statement is welcome. Otherwise, I will be looking at the local organizers and see whether we can proceed to the reception. Uh, Petra, how are we doing here? Can, can, can we? Yeah, okay. So thank you very much. For Having come, and thanks again, Chris.